There is a quick, quick question we have. Please clarify what are the differences of Vedantic and Upanishadic students and why is it so? Vedantic students, I don't know what, what is the question or meaning by Vedantic students? Yeah, sorry. Clarification, we have this. In several classes, I have heard you mention the above item. Please plan check. Okay. Oh, I, I had referred as it. Okay, okay. If I had referred, there's a difference, there's a difference. Independently, there is no difference. Vedantic student means you are an Upanishadic student. That's the meaning of it. Now, what I must, uh, what I must have been referring to is the students who are attending the classes. That's what we generally refer to as Vedanta students. So I refer to the students who attend my class. Right. And there is a difference between the students who are attending my class versus open aesthetic students. That difference we should understand. There is a clear distinction between the two because of, of the, the idea of what is their agenda. In that, there is a difference. And what is the qualification? There is a difference. What is the purpose with which you come? When I say that, today when you logged into the class, what was the thought? And how is it that you sitting in the class or listening to these lectures, you are connecting it to your Evolution or realization, or technically what we call as moksha. If you are not making a conscious link, and it has to be a systematic link, not simply saying, sir, attending your class, I will get realization. It's not just you know jumping you know, from this to that. Then we will ask, suppose if you don't attend one, one class, what will happen to you? See, there, there's no problem, sir. At least earlier days, we, had, we have to ask someone, is there a recording available? Now, we don't have to worry. It's available on YouTube. Right. In fact, better version. Why now all this unnecessary things are all, you know, deleted. And there is a better de description also given there. So those who, are, who wants to, you know, learn, See, they don't have to listen to the entire, you know, video. Just read the description box, they will get the whole idea. See, it's slightly better, sir. Now, idea is what? What is the idea with which you are sitting in this class, listening to this lecture? First one. And then, if you say that I am doing it for my evolution or for my realization, self-development, 
self realization all this how are you establishing the link that also you should get to. after fixing the link consciously only this becomes you become a upanishad student number 1 number 2 this you may establish a link but then or you qualified for that in the qualification also there is a difference what is the qualification i have i have told you technical qualification means we we say sadhana chatushtaya sampat there are four fold qualifications are adhikaritvam is established with this four fold things theoretically viveka vairagya shat sampati mumukshatva these are the four fold qualifications the upanishadic student is one who is the one who has this four fold qualifications is an upanishadic student that is too technical then how do you understand i always give two examples or rather generally should be giving three examples three people you can keep in mind the courage to question and explore kato upanishad student that uh, achiketas had the courage to question and explore the subject number 1 number 2 speaking the truth uncompromisingly speaking the truth satyagam chandogya upanishad the distaste towards the material pleasures worldly pleasures maitri of bhradarani kopanish so remember these three people courage of achiketas uncompromisingly speaking the truth satyagama and a distaste towards materiality disinterest my three if you have all three you are a upanishad student almost i know 90% of people who are sitting in the class some of them i don't know who they are right i don't want to read names and then you know some numbers are all coming here so i don't even know who they are but for about those people who i know the intensity with which we possess this qualities in us defines now you can turn around and ask the same question towards me also sir upanishad guru is one who is supposed to be a, a shrutriya and a brahmanishta the one who is a shrutriya shrutriya means the one who is well read also the one who has the ability to communicate so he should have two things one he should have good expertise in the field in the field of the shastras number 1 number 2 he should have the capacity to communicate the one who possesses the two is called a shrutriya and he has to be a brahmanishta a brahmanishta is one who is is established in the brahmatvam the brahmanhood in that realization the one who has the experience of brahman 
the one who has tasted it, who, who has known Brahman by his own experience, the one who has got that Prokshan Bhuti, he is called a, a Guru, Upanishadi Guru. So what we need to understand here is, you are not Upanishadic student, means neither you are Upanishadic student nor am I Upanishadic Guru. But both of us will study Upanishad. Why not? I don't know why. Hey, don't ask me, sir, when you are not qualified, you should not know, correct? I have my own agenda. So, if you say, sir, are you a Shrutotriya? Shru doubtful. Half we can say. Okay. Half Shrutotriya we can say. Correct. Brahmanishtana is a long way to go. So, from my side, from your side, what you have to do is this. From my side, what I have to do is a different effort. So what is the difference between the Vedantic student and Upanishadic student? Anyone can be a Vedantic student. But everyone cannot be a Upanishadic student. Because it necessitates certain qualifications. The Adhigaritvam is needed. Preparation is needed. The one who is qualified and well prepared is the one who we call as a Upanishadic student. So that is the difference here. That's what I you know, generally I refer. And there is a difference between Vedanti students and Vedanta students and Upanishadic students. Right. Even we say there is a difference between even the Gita students and the Upanishadic students. Bhagavad Gita student is Arjuna. Arjuna was seeking this knowledge, not out of his will, when he was in a situation where he could, could not handle that situation, he sought the knowledge. So, situation driven seeker, Arjuna. Upanishadic students are not situation driven. They were all self driven seekers. In fact, their life is so good and so comfortable. I'll give the example of Mahashala. Mudaga Upanishad says, Shaunaka, the student of Mudaga Upanishad, says, is a Mahashala, means the one who is comfortable. Janaka, student. Maitri, she was getting a fortune from her husband because Yagya Vilkya was a great teacher and he had the patronage of Janaka himself. And imagine you know, a king's patronage if you have and he is a good king and he is a good student. He was giving like anything. And not only Janaka, he had thousands of students. So to all of them, he had a huge wealth. Finally, one day he says that I'm going to divide this wealth into two halves between his two wives. Katyaini and Maitreyi. Yes, I'm dividing this between you two. I'm taking, I'm getting into Sanyasa Ashram. Because Yagi Malkia was a Grihastha before that. He's going to, I'm going to enter into Sanyasa Ashram. So I'm going to give up all this. Maitri says, that is the time she starts the inquiry. Maitri. Obviously this means you are seeking something which this wealth cannot give. Therefore, I don't want it. I will give my entire portion also to the first wife. 
unbelievable one. The second wife giving up the entire property rights. Today you can go to this, you know, courts in India. It's real estate, these people say. The, hardly you will find a property in India without any dispute. It's very rare to find uh, things. 70% of the, the cases that is pending in the court is property dispute. What a fight. Hmm? That's what my three is. Yes, let her take the whole thing. I don't want it. And he gives it up completely to the first wife. It's unbelievable. Between brothers, there is no this one. Yesterday, Purni was telling me. First time she has seen that. The dispute. Mediator. She sees first time mediator. And this is a property dispute. She says, I got so scared. The way they were looking at each other, the swearing they are doing, so scared the fellow can, fortunately he's not having a gun. He has a gun, the fellow will take it and shoot the other. See where they are speaking. And who are they, na, brothers? I am not saying you know, immediately, okay, all of you call your brothers, sisters and say, take away all the property, whatever I have, and then come to me. Can we have that, you know, that distaste? See, it's nothing. That is my thing. No, the disinterest this. And Arjuna is fighting for what? Huh? Property dispute, no? You have any two countries in the world, neighboring countries, where there is no dispute, border dispute. Do we have two states where there is no dis dispute? Two districts within a state. So you come down, you will not find two houses. That's why Christ said, Love thy neighbor as thyself. That is impossible for us. We can love everyone around us. Far distanced people we can love nicely. But close ones, it's impossible to love. Yes, now thy neighbor they said. And now Upanishad is student. So the one who has that quality, what are the qualifications now? I say orthodox one is this four. Viveka, Vairagya, Shatsampati, Mumukshatra. One side. Other side, we derive. My derivation is these three people. My ideal, uh, you know, students. The moment anywhere we discuss Upanishadic student, immediately bring in these three names. Nachiketas, Maitreyi, Satyagama. These three you should bring in mind. And keep them as a reference point and look at yourself. We will know the difference between Vedanta students and Upanishadic students. So that's the difference. Having said that Brahman is that which cannot be explained, that which cannot be communicated because of the limitations of the equipments. It cannot be communicated. Why it cannot be communicated? Because of the limitation of the equipments. And the words cannot carry that. Nor silence can carry. 
knowledge. Silence can never carry knowledge. Remember that. Okay. Silence is not going to carry. Lot of people give the reference of the Dakshina Murti. When, when the Sanakadi Munis, when they were searching for knowledge, they found the Dakshina Murti. And they went to him because of the tejas they saw in him. They went to the Dakshina Murti and asked very many questions. As a lot of questions. To all their questions, Dakshina Murti gave answers. Like Bhishma giving answer to Yudhishthra. And finally, Yudhishthra asked, Kimekam Daivatam Loke Kimvap Ekam Parayana. Kim Ekam Daivam. In this world, tell me that one God whom I should worship. Who is that? Tell me that one. That's where he gave Vishwam, Vishnu, Vashatkaru and all that. That one God is Vishnu. He has to be worshipped through this Sahasranama. That's how we have this Vishnu Sahasranama in the in this, in this uh, Shanti Parva. Mahamahamahamahamahamartha. There it comes. Same way. When the Sanagadi Munis were sitting there, finally they asked the Dakshana Murti, what is the ultimate teaching of yours? Beautiful question they asked. They said, Guru, we are asking questions from our limited understanding. Take pity on us. Because in our ignorance, we don't even know what to ask. Therefore, you give your highest knowledge to us. Fascinating question, but see, what is your highest? Give that to us. That is the time he just showed this Chin Mudra and went into silence. And Dakshina Murthy did not admit any other student after that. He had only four students. He did not admit anyone else in his school. Dakshina Murthy School of Vedanta. In that school, only four students joined. All retired people. Right. And one course only he conducted. One class he did. And then he entered into silence. I said, after that, I'm not going to speak to anyone else. Another student. Because he has seen the best student in his life. The highest. So same way here. He just goes into that silence. There, the message is, the only way that you can learn is not through words, by your observation. Through observing me, you absorb, you dissolve. Like that lady asked Christ, no? Who is God? He said, behold thy Lord. When I'm standing here, now what, where are you searching? Says, where are you going? Says, I'm here. When I'm here, where are you going? Same way, he says, by keen observation, you absorb. Now, you can't start that. Don't try. Right? Because Parallelly, you also should go into silence to observe. Right? You get lost in things. You are not alert and observing. How do you know, sir? Go for one of the most boring movie. Sit in that 
buy the ticket, go and sit in the, in the theater or log on to your TV. A movie which you consider as the most worst movie, sir. Such a boring one. Impossible for anyone to even believe that someone could, can make a movie like this. In that movie, can you keep that thought, alertness in you that it's just a movie? In such a boring movie, you will forget. See, you will forget. Now we think that is so good about it. It is getting involved and getting lost in the field, remember. The objectivity is to keep that awareness going. Where are we now? What are we doing? What is the surrounding? That capacity to observe is possible only when you are silenced. When your mind is silenced alone, you can do observation. That observative capacity is called as objectivity. When it is externalized, it's called observative power. When you internalize, it's called objectivity. It's the same thing. It's like we say, no. When you identify with the lower object or being, we call it as love. When you direct the same identification towards a higher object or being, it's called devotion. The emotion is same. Only direction is different. Similarly, that alertness is same. If it is directed outside, it's called observation. If it is directed internally, it's called objectivity. Now, before you can even think of objectivity, First, you should have the power to observe. Now, Sanagadi Munis achieved that. Therefore, the Dakshinamurti said, Chin Mudra is enough. Look at me. Enough, he says. Now, you can't go and sit in front of that Dakshinamurti photograph and keep on looking at it. Nothing will happen to you. Remember, silence also will not work. So, instruments not, words cannot, silence also cannot. When none of these things are possible, knowing fully well it is not possible through these things, these masters attempt to explain that Brahman to us. How? No, that's where they brought in this idea of Trinity. Three things, Shara, Akshara, and Uttama Purusha. Shara means perishable. Akshara means imperishable. Beyond this Shara and Akshara, because Shara and Akshara both are intellectual concepts. Akshara is an intellectual concept. And God or Brahman is not an intellectual concept. It is beyond that. To explain it is beyond that intellectual concept, they brought in this idea of Uttama Purusha. So, through this trinity, they have explained what this is this Brahman. What is this is God. And he gives a beautiful example to explain that. With what they explain. It's exactly like you're explaining to a person who doesn't know what is a desert. It's a hot sand. But he sees a mirage. So what he sees a mirage is a desert, he thinks. And then you say, no, no, no. Beneath that is the hot sand. And then you have is you think only that there is desert. That area is called desert. He says, no, no, no. All over. This is called a desert. Now, how to communicate to a person who doesn't know anything about it is an interesting thing. It's like Sigmund Freud. Now, he gives a beautiful instance in his life. He 
he notes, it seems he had a visitor from his village, very old man, very old, who has no idea of this modern developments and all that. He doesn't know any of those things. He just comes from a village. And in those days, you know, traveling through through the train, you know, you know those days, you know, the train means, you know, the, the cold and the dust, is that and all those things. So the, the, those days when, uh, when anyone comes home, even I do remember, when someone comes from outstation, from Delhi, if a person has to reach Chennai, it would take two and a half days. For two and a half days, they were sitting in the train and traveling, kara, 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 kara. and then, you know, and they, you know, we don't take, you know, this uh, Uber, Ola was not there. So you have to get down from the station, come to the bus stand, take a bus, get off in this bus stop and then walk. So from central station, they have to come out, stand at the bus stop, take a bus, come to Mailapur, get down from Mailapur tank and then walk. After two and a half days of praying. As soon as they come, we don't start inquiring. How are you? What is happening? What is the story? That story? Nothing. My grandma will say, first go and have bath. She will say, have bath, eat, and then we can talk. You will not ask anything. Say, first let's have bath, eat, sleep, and then let's talk. Same thing is what Zygmunt Fai told his friend also. And that man was so tired. He was late in the night. And Sigmund Freud asked him to have food and then said, go to sleep. And he had put him to the room. He showed him the guest room. Showed the guest room and then he went to his room, had a good nap, you know, good sleep. And the next day morning, he got ready and all those things. And he comes to meet this man in the guest room. And the guest opens the door. Eyes are bloodshot. You know, bloodshot. Obviously, he didn't sleep the entire night. It's quite visible for him. And he asks, why you didn't sleep, is it? You didn't sleep? He says, no, I couldn't sleep. Because whole night I was busy. Doing what? How can I sleep with this bright lights on? So whole night I was trying to put off the light. And whatever I did, the light is not going off. I couldn't sleep. And Sigmund Freud said, all that you have to do is what? Just come and switch this button. That's all. Just have to come and tap it. It will go off. And that fellow couldn't believe. What has that got to do with this? You know, there's no connection, you know between this and that. And Sigmund Freud tells that fellow, so stupid you are, and he goes back. After that, Sigmund Freud introspects. What that man must have been doing in the room? What is the method he knows? Put off the light. And some of you may remember those days. Used to have lights now in the in the houses. How they had? My grandfather's house never had electricity, so they will have light. The light will be put on by evening six o'clock, and then by ten o'clock we have to put off. What did they do? We just have, we used to play with that actually. With one blow, you should put it off. You know, the one who has that power is a, is a strong man. All we used to play with it. Slowly we blow, we play with the things. The only way this man knew how to put off the light is by blowing it. So he, whole night, what was he doing? He just standing next to that bulb and blowing it. <laughs> He does, nothing is happening. And it's too bright for them, you know, for their eyes. 
Those lights are too bright for them. Couldn't sleep. Now, Sigmund Freud writes, who is an idiot? He or me? This. Because knowing that he is coming from the place, I should have told him, no? I should have informed him how to switch it off. To me, it is too obvious. But for him, it's not. Exactly same situation for these masters. To those masters, Brahman is obvious. For us, it is something which is impossible. So they had to come down to our level and explain. How do they explain? First thing they say, it is known. What is known to you? World is what is known to you. So they stand from the world. So what is known? The world that you are seeing, no? Yes. This world is his creation. Oh. As a creator. Wow. See, see, no, 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 no. The world is not just a creation. He's not just a creator. He himself became the world. So God is not a creator. God is a creation. Then what is understanding you will get? Creation gets destroyed. Creation is imperishable. Sorry, perishable. Because anything changes. Since everything in the world is changing, we will believe God is also changing constantly. So he says, no, no, no. God is not a perishable one. God is the supporter of this. So God is not standing as this creation. He, Even though he is the creation, he stands beyond that creation also. So God is imminent and transcendent. God is imminent in the world as Akshara. God is transcendent as Akshara. The student says, wow, now I have understood. What is God? Immediately they say, no, he is even beyond that. So first they'll say, how can this world come about? There cannot be the world without a creator. Correct? Because nothing in the world comes by itself. There is someone who is making it. So there is a creator. And then we say, of course there are very many ways in which they derive that. Now we are not going into how that or not, because those things we will do when we are doing this 15th chapter of the Gita. There he explains all that. You know, so, you know, we can't go into how it is, Shara, how they derive it. First step is this. First thing they say is, God is a creator. Next step, they say, God is not a creator standing apart from this. God himself became the creator. So what is it, sir? He is the instrumental cause First, then they say he is not only instrumental cause, he is the material cause also. Like the example of pot making. For there is a pot maker, uses a clay and makes a pot. So the pot maker is the instrumental cause. A clay is a material cause for the potter. So first thing they say, God is the instrumental cause. Then they say, no, no, no. God is also the material cause. So Nimitta Karana and Upadana Karana. Both are together. Thereby what happens? God is not just the creator. God is the creation itself. Then you see the creation. 
and you see the creation is constantly changing, perishing. Therefore, you may come to a conclusion that God is, a, is also perishing. Then you say, no, no, no. God stands as the supporter. That imperishable supporter who stands beyond this is God. Then you understand again what supporter means. He is supporting wherever the world is. And you limit that supporter to the spectrum of the universe, the world. One universe or multiverse or whatever you call it. Right. Because this Dr. Strange will say multi-universe is there. Right. You don't care. Even if you believe multi-universe, there is a supporter for that. So wherever there is a conception, because this is just an intellectual conception. This Akshara is an intellectual conclusion. And God is not an intellectual conclusion. Therefore, you need to transcend that also. Then you have this Uttama Purusha. Who is speaking all these things? Who is presenting all these things? All these things are presented in this Vedanta. Right. Now, what is this Vedanta, sir? Vedanta means three things. There are three things. Put together is called Vedanta. Upanishads, Brahma Sutra, and Bhagavad Gita. Referred to popularly as Prasthanatraya. What is this Prasthanatraya? Upanishads. Upanishads are what? Shruti Prasthana. Bhagavad Gita is the Smriti Prasthana. And Brahma Sutra is the Nyaya Prasthana. Explaining it logically. So, this Vedanta. See, generally we call, you know, Vedanta philosophy. See, strictly speaking, it is a wrong way to call it like it. By the meaning of the word philosophy. Not because of Vedanta, remember. The meaning of the word philosophy, Vedanta doesn't qualify for it. To be called as philosophy, actually speaking. Why not? Because philosophy means an independent intellectual conclusions is called a philosophy. Remember this. Independent means no other support of any scripture. Without any scriptural support, without the aid of any scripture, you apply your thinking, apply your reasoning and arrive at certain conclusions. So, unaided by the scriptural thinking is called a philosophy. Now, Vedanta, we say what? Prasthanatraya. Prasthanatraya means what? Sir? Immediately we say this, the support of the three things. Shruti pra Support is there, Smriti is there, and Nyaya Prasthana is there. This Nyaya Prasthana is also is what Brahma Sutra is also what now? It is taking from the Upanishads only. The idea that is presented in the Upanishads. What is the conclusion of the Upanishads where taken out by Vyasa and derived it, arrived at it logically presented that is called a Brahma Sutra. That's why we call that as Nyaya Prasthana. Establishing it logically. And all that reasoning that is done by Vyasa in this Bra 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 Brahma Sutra, we find taking support of the 
statements given in the Vedas. Vedas meaning the Upanishads. Upanishadic portion it takes separately and, and you know it does the analysis. Reasoning is done. So therefore, Vedanta cannot be strictly called as philosophy. That is why we call it as a darshana. Vedanta darshana we say. Means perception. Seeing. One way of seeing the truth is called as darshana. In that Brahma Sutra, Vyasa establishes the supremacy of Vedanta dar dar Darshana by refuting 11 other schools, 11 other philosophies. Now I am just using the word philosophy in a liberal manner. Most of the time when we use the word philosophy, we are using it in a in a in a lib lib liberal way, not in a strict term, right? But you have to know the difference. Now tomorrow, you know, when someone says, "How can you say Vedanta philosophy?" Uh, you should not say, "You know, I don't know this." We know it is not. Then what is it called? It is called a darshana. So in this, what is he doing? Is he is taking this Vedanta darshana? Supremacy is established. That is the Brahma Sutra. That is why we celebrate this Guru Purnima. You know, Guru Purnima is the oldest celebration we had in this country. The oldest surviving celebration is Guru Purnima. It's also called as Vyasa Purnima. Why Vyasa Purnima? Is because Vyasa is treated as the central figure. The most ideal Guru is Vyasa. Because he has a role in all the three pr pr Prasthanatrayas. In all the three authoritative texts his hand is there. Shruti, Pramana, Upanishads. Yasa is the one who compiled the four Vedas and arranged it in this manner and said, this is the way it is. This is Rig Veda. This is Ijur Veda. This is Sama Veda. This is Atharvana Veda. And these Vedas were divided in these sections. All this was done by Yasa. And he is the author of Brahma Sutra. He compiled the Vedas. He authored the Brahma Sutra, which is the Nyaya Prasthana. And the Gita, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, that coming in the Mahabharata, was authored by Vyasa Gita. Since in all these three authoritative texts, Linked to Vyasa, we worship on his birthday. We worship all the Guru Parampara. That is a Guru Purnima. And today, none of us know about it. Another reason, Upanishadic student, we say, no. What is the difference between Upanishadic student and Vedanta students? We should be looking forward for this Guru Purnima. You see, it's like, it's like Diwali. How much preparations is done for Diwali? Like that we should have for the Shankaranti, Dasara, for most of us, all these things are just a holiday. That's about it. You know? And in that, Guru Purnima is the one which has is completely forgotten today. Only in pockets few people are celebrating it. 
such a such a tra tragedy it just shows the deterioration in our value system and uh, it's about it see there is no longer we you know education should be teacher driven teacher centric or student centric hmm? education should revolve around the teacher or the student today it has become a student centric everyone starts looking at the student as a client the students also live like a clients only which educational institutions will have a good placement options a placement is not job of the educational institution they are supposed to teach and pack you off get out the teachers responsibility education institution means what teacher Now you can't say it is a teacher's responsibility to give you employment with the knowledge that he gives if you cannot fend yourself and that also teacher has to do for you na that shows why the country is like this the world is like this today why the whole world is at such a mess ha huh? it's because we have completely moved away from the mainstream this vyasa the powerful personality he establishes the vedanta darshana and we are supposed to be the students of vedanta darshana right now there is a problem who is teaching this chara akshara uttama purusha all this this vedanta right when you come into vedanta there is a problem the problem inside vedanta is you find there are different schools exist inside vedanta only and the, the most popular one is the three dvaita Vishishta Dvaita and Advaita. These three schools were the most most popular one. There is a Shiva Vishishta Dvaita school is there. There is Shuddha Dvaita school is there. Like that, very many schools are there. You know, propounded by different uh, you know different people, but all of them fall under this category. of what is it this vedanta now the problem comes to the student is which one to follow who am i go who is a who is which school i have to subscribe to don't say i will take all schools that is not possible right because when you read each one each one presented in very many ways and the best part of it is all of them take the same brahma sutra the same upanishads the same bhagavad gita and interpreted to establish their school and not only establish their school they refute the other in this the first school is is formed by shankara because he is much earlier to ramanuja and madhva i'm not going into the sri kanta and then you know vallabhacharya uh, all those people i'm not going into each each one like this we are just taking three major schools 
other schools we are not going into those details but if you go into those details it will become too much right now when they are taking which one to follow because if you say sir let us see who is the best based on that we will decide huh shankara is also an avatar ramanuja is also an avatar purusha madhvacharya is also avatar purusha all three were avatar purushas right now if you take the greatness of the master on that i am going to be deciding ha huh? all three are avatar purushas now on what basis are we to take a call now what are we to do and let's see who is presenting it very logically next option we have is okay sir there are different schools are there we are all you know intellectual people we will go by logic logically we should be able to see uh, all these three schools have written books on logic this tarka all three have used tarka and all of them shata dushani there's a book eh he writes explains 100 defects in advaita right to counter that there is another book shata bhushani don't think that is a, a defects criticisms we want this polominical eh? text they call it these people have written now if he says this is a criticism that 100 what you are calling as the defects are not defects actually they are the glory of this counter that like that these people have been writing books left right center and what is interesting is till date the dispute is not settled logically no one was able to arrive at a, a settlement what is what sir avatar purushas Okay, nothing can be done. Acharyas, based on Acharyas, can we define? No. Okay, then can we go based on the the logic? They are also all of them are logical. They are also nothing can be done. Then there is a third option we have. The third option, they say, is can you make a choice? based on which system has a divine support like in those days they used to do that no when this you know when these people wrote this trivulu uh, he wrote this trikurul even our prime you know prime minister finance minister and all keep quoting every time trikurul from tamil literature considered as one of the chief works but when he when he wants to publish it before publishing it needs to be read out in the assembly of scholars and the scholars rejected it straight away right because the structure itself is faulty they said it is a faulty structure it doesn't fit into the definition of a poetry the poetry is supposed to be having four lines eight lines seven lines 
and then there has to be this this man has written a text with one and a half lines all that he has written about 1100 you know verses are there all of that has only eight words how can you five words first line three words second line how can you have a poetry which is just about one and a half lines rejected straight away then how to unless they acknowledge it it will, it will not be accepted as a authentic work so what to do they took it to the pond in my in madurai you know the meenakshi temple there is a pond there you will find in the pond now there is no water i think in those days they had full water they will throw that if it floats and comes back it is accepted as god as saraswati has accepted the text if it drowns it will be it has been it has been rejected by the god as saraswati so they throw that and there is a flower that comes a golden lotus appears there in the golden lotus this tirukural was kept and that's how they say my god this text is is accepted by saraswati and she had considered this as one of the highest recognition was given by goddess herself therefore that is to be accepted because of the divine inter, inter intervention similar thing we see in in kalidasa similar thing we have seen for uh, you know gyaneshwar you know very many people you know so many texts we have seen be accepted by people because of the divine support now if you come here all these three schools claim there is a divine support now all three has a divine support now what to do now remember imagine the person is discussing about is radio therapy or chemotherapy there are two things they give no or cancer which is better the debate is going on right the one who has cancer right he will no longer read that as an academic issue for those experts and scholars the distinction between which therapy is better is more of an academic issue intellectual issue as far as they are concerned but the one who has got a has got cancer he cannot say i will try all that stuff isn't it i'll try this also i'll try that also this also i will do that also i will do this also i will do everything cannot be done now what you have to do you got to make a choice you have to choose and when you are choosing one you have to reject the other that's called choice isn't it they say i'm going to make a choice that means you are rejecting the other sir i'm choosing to buy this car that means you are rejecting all other cars correct will you say that but it amounts to that isn't it now you may you can't tell you may to say you reject it you re- reject that brand you may to say that brand is useless that is useless no 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 i have a, i i have to make a choice and a choice means i have to choose one 
That means I got to reject many. That's why they call it as a paralysis. When there is more choices given to people, they get into a state of paralysis. They don't choose anything. This is the study. Again, insurance policies. Option A, option B. Choose this policy or that policy. Number of people making choices. Then, to another set of people, they gave about 19 policies. 19 options are there. Choose any one of it. They found the number of people making choice considerably reduced. They inquired why. Because the problem is not the choice that I am making is correct or not. That's not their problem. The problem is they may be losing out a better option. The thought of losing out a better option possibility because if I choose one, I am rejecting 18. Something that is existing in that one which is not available in all 18. What is that one? What is so great about this one versus other 18? It's the same thing for every one of them. All 19 cases, it's the same thing. But in the first experiment, they had only three options. Option A, B, C, full stop. So the choice is what now? So limited the choice, say this is, is a choice paralysis people go into. Because of the choice, they get into that state. Now here, when you are suffering from the samsaric cancer, huh? what are we going to do? Here, it's not the choice between which is right. It is mutually exclusive. Each one of them were mutually exclusive here. Because we cannot say, I will use this for some time leave it and then use that for some time. That is also not possible here. Because there are so many differences. So many contradictions. Conflicting things. We do see here. So what are we going to do? When you come to this Vedanta, immediately you will encounter these three schools. In these three schools, you have to make a choice. Now, on what basis you will make a choice? And why do you make such a choice? And why there are three schools? And how understanding the schools with its various differences is going to help you in understanding the Supreme Reality. By understanding the Supreme Reality, you cross over and achieve whatever you have to achieve. Now, this is the questions that we will be dealing with in the next topic. The three schools of thought. So the three schools are this, Dvaita, Vasishta Dvaita, and Dvaita. Dvaita schools, main Acharya. It's not founded by them. Right? It's the main one. Dvaita school, Madhvacharya. Vasishta Dvaita, Ramanujacharya. And Advaita, Shankaracharya. And what is that school and how you 
can attempt to reconcile it at your personal level. Remember, this is only for our personal level. Right? I am choosing. I am choosing something. Now, I am choosing something doesn't mean other is wrong. That is the essential point you got to remember before you study here. That's why I gave the full big, big introduction is only for this. All this is only for the story. That making you have to choose only one. But you make the choice and the choice is your personal choice. Your personal choice has got nothing to do with the other person. That doesn't mean other two are wrong. That doesn't mean other two are any less. Right? That doesn't mean other two acharyas are of any less. Remember, you are making a choice. That's it. Now for that, I have to know about the three a little bit. See, you need to get some idea of what are they. And then we can see how they are connected. Right? Uh, it will look little technical, but then it's easy to follow. Not a, not a big difficulty. Right? But these three schools, Dvaita, Vasishtha Dvaita, Advaita. About these three schools and their application, we will see in the next class. Thank you.